and I'm here with uh, Brandon and Lance Kramer, uh, writer and producer of The First Step. I really like this documentary, and I kind—I of, don't know if you see it this way. I see The First Step as a double entendre. Uh, one of them being obviously the First Step Act, First Step Act. Um, but the se- the double entendre portion of it, I see is. Um, I don't think uh, it's about the first step. I think it's about the first step is uh, putting people before politics. And as much as it's a cliche to say that, people don't do that. And I think this uh, documentary illustrates that beautifully. Yeah, I think well said, Eric. Um, that that was the goal of making the film was to really humanize and understand what is the you know personal emotional journey of human beings fighting for other human beings who are currently locked up unjustly in prisons and what does it look like to step into really uncomfortable places what does it look like to build relationships across really painful dividing lines to get those people home from prison um, this is a story that, you know, we, Lance and I made this film because we were deeply concerned about the divisions in this country and the lack of progress on any of the issues that we cared about. And Van, Lewis, Jessica, all the advocates featured in this film, uh, Virgie Walker, Pete White, Tylo James, Doug Copenhaver, all these people they put their politics aside and took enormous personal risks to work across these dividing lines and make themselves very vulnerable and open them this painful and really difficult journey up to us as filmmakers. And we hope that the result of that is something that audiences can really like sit, sit back or sit forward and experience what bridge building in this divisive moment actually looks like from a very human, you know, messy, personal perspective. What's your thoughts on uh, just political documentaries in general? Because a lot of them I see, anytime I see a political documentary, my eyes roll in the back of my head and go, okay, this one's going to be cooked or whatever. But this one seemed to uh, be pretty fair for the most part. I'm sure there are people disagree because as uh, everyone knows, politics is a sports you know, rooting for your sports team, but I, I felt this one to be quite fair. But what what are your thoughts of uh, political documentaries in general? You know, I can I can share, Lance, if you have anything you want to add. I I personally am less interested in documentaries. I'm not, they play an important role, but as a, as a viewer, I'm less interested in watching films that go in with a very specific message and point that they're trying to make. And the film is basically an argument for that point. Just personally, I'm more interested in seeing the complexities of of politics play out and the contradictions, the paradoxes, and just being challenged. And so when we set out to make this film, Lance and I had conversations at the very get-go that if we're going to tell a story about bridge building, and this is frankly the ethic that we've put into all of our films, we need to create an empathetic experience that is not just with Van and his team, but is also with advocates on the left who opposed this bill, like uh, Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, or Pete White, who are doing incredible work on criminal justice reform, you know, and and really try to understand what does it mean to have an abolitionist uh, strategy and why is that important? And also conservatives like Jared Kushner and, you know, Rand Paul and Senator Mike Lee and What does it mean to be a conservative and be working on this issue and why are their views, you know, important? And so the whole ethic of the film has been to create an experience where a very diverse group of people from different political backgrounds can watch a movie with people that they love and represent how they feel and people that they don't like who don't represent how they feel. And the goal is not to be convinced of any one other political view, but to gain some understanding and empathy and maybe like less being walking out of the theater, feeling like people that oppose their viewpoints or have different viewpoints are not enemies, but understanding that they have a different opinion. And this is why. Anything to add to that, Lance? Yeah. Like Brandon, I mean, like Brandon said, there's... I think like you said too, you know, politics to a certain extent is a sport. And so sports have teams, Super Bowl last night. Yeah. 
you don't just see one team play itself teams play each other and so i think that it's important to gain a better understanding of actually what that looks like when the parties are trying to work through these differences which nowadays seem to be really as significant maybe amongst as significant as it's been in the country's history but nonetheless the meeting or the lack thereof of the parties needs to be understood better because without that we don't have a country so i feel like there's a role in storytelling to play in narratives about rallying the troops and you know fortifying a message and i think that that is important for all points of view to have those kinds of narratives but i don't think it's just that and i think part of the problem in the landscape around films especially nonfiction films is that the understanding about what is a political doc kind of stops there where it's that a political film is just this point of view or that point of view left right or whatever the case may be this 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 cause this campaign and that actually like brandon said messiness of doing the work or trying to navigate uh, conflicts in a productive way through the system doesn't have a lot of space and i think it's really important to tell those kinds of stories if we're going to have a democracy. Um, also, I saw that uh, uh, you have on IMDb, it's got Chris L. Jenkins listed as story consultant. What was his role in this? And how did that help kind of bring in the documentary together? Sure. Chris is an amazing storyteller. He comes from a journalistic background. He worked at The Post for a long time and a bunch of other publications and has been working in film uh, the last decade more, more prolifically. Chris is a pr- he has an expert understanding of uh, criminal justice as just a set of issues. He's a black man, so his just identity and own personal experience is different than ours. He's older than us also, so he just has different life experience being someone that's 15 plus years older than us. Sorry to date him, but and uh, and was just an invaluable presence in part also because he stepped into the process in the edit, so he wasn't there while we were in the thick of production and came in with also a fresh set of eyes. So while we were like super deep in everything that was the film, Chris was able to step in with the, not just his identity and his talent as a filmmaker, but also the perspective of just being fresh. And he really helped us workshop the hell out of the film and was there with us from a decently early part of the edit through literally the final cut. And it's still been out there you know, helping us to navigate the kind of perilous waters of distribution. And there was several other people like Chris, um, editorial consult, consulting editors like Eddie Martinez and Carol Dysinger, Steve James, Louis Erskine, unfortunately, who passed away. Oh, in the Sorry to hear that. Um, but, you know, these amazing artists, filmmakers that all threw their head and hearts into, into the edit in particular. So uh, I, I guess uh, just uh, last thing, uh, do you have, well, you've worked with Van Jones before, uh, The Messy Truth, and I'm assuming that's what brought you along here. What was the, uh, I, I guess, the spark that's like, oh, we did that, we, there's more story to tell, Let, let's do this one. And, and why this story in particular? Yeah, so, you know, we knew Van for a few years before The Messy Truth. So we already had a relationship with him All before right. even that. In the lead up to the 2016 election, Van was on CNN having these fierce debates with conservative uh, pundits. Those debates were gaining a lot of traction. People were looking at those conversations as really a, uh, a model for how to work through the polarization of the 2016 election. And Van, Lance, and I were talking about how while that opened up a lot of doors and and a lot of empathy and understanding, there was a different kind of conversation that wasn't happening on CNN in the studio, which needed to happen, which was in people, everyday people's lives, in their living room. And so we came up with an idea to pull together a team of filmmakers And came up with this idea to film Van going into the homes of Trump supporters in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, in the weeks before the 2016 election, very simply modeling how to have a conversation with people you disagree with. We shot it all in a day. We edited it with a team of volunteers. We released it on Van's Facebook page. The series blew up. It was seen by about 4 million people. It won a few Webby Awards. 
Uh, it led to the eventual creation of a CNN show called The Messy Truth as well. And that journey of just making this little web series that reached you know millions of people's lives when Trump actually won the election and was elected and Van was setting out to spend the next four years working across the aisle under that administration, he graciously, you know, there was a lot of trust between us and he graciously opened his life and his team's lives up to our cameras and to us to capture that journey. It took a while to get the level of trust to, you know, really make the film. So the first year of filming, we were, you know, really trying to figure out how do we tell a story like this? How do we get into the halls of the Senate, the White House, uh, into these really sensitive backdoor conversations? How do we build that level of trust? And uh, that took a while. But once we did, you know, we were sort of locked into this story and didn't, didn't let go for three years and then had 400 hours of footage. And it took us two years to edit it into what is now the first step. Well, that sounds awesome. Um, this seems kind of gauche even asked us, uh, considering the conversation we've had so far, but my co-host has a box and in that box are movies that people like to, uh, put into the box that, uh, they think are quite underseen. But I think, uh, with this, I kind of want to go a little specific. Are there any, uh, maybe, uh, political films or documentaries that you would like to put in the box that you think represent maybe, uh, some good ideas or, uh, just, uh, represents, uh, fair filmmaking in the documentary sphere? Yeah, I'll. I'll say something. Um, is this a metaphorical box or is it actually a box? He has an actual box. He writes it, it down, puts box. it in the box and draws That's it awesome. every... <laughs> I love it. Uh, there's, there's a, I love movies, obviously. So I have a long list, but I'll pick one to put in the box if I can only put one in. Um, it's a film called Crisis, Inside a Presidential Commitment. Uh, it was made by a filmmaker named Robert Drew and then a team of filmmakers that include included Richard... Leacock and uh, D.A. Pennybaker, a young D.A. Pennybaker. It's a film that they made during the Kennedy administration, where basically those filmmakers wanted to document what it looked like for Kennedy to essentially handle a crisis. And the crisis that they wound up documenting was when George Wallace blocked enrollment of the first Black students at the University of Alabama. And the film takes the point of view of how Kennedy dealt with it, how Robert F. Kennedy dealt with it at the Department of Justice, and then how George Wallace and the governor's mansion managed the situation, and then also how those students and their families navigated the moment. It's an incredible document of history. It's also just an incredible piece of filmmaking because you see all these different points of view in real time going through this incredibly tense and uh, pivotal moment in American history. And it, just the way it's told is, is like sensation, is, is, is phenomenal. But it's also very even handed. And I mean, it was also just cinematically, I think, a breakthrough at the time because they were just developing handheld cameras and things like that. That sounds great. I'll, I'll, I'll add to the box the documentary, The Overnighters. Um, oh, the, the Boondock Saints one? Or am I thinking of something else? You're thinking of something else. Oh, okay. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's all good. It's a, it's a feature documentary. I, I don't think we're thinking of the same film. Um, it came out, I don't know, maybe close to a decade ago at this point. Um, and it follows a pastor in a church, pastor of a church in North Dakota. Um, it's an extremely complicated story about a protagonist that is trying something very controversial in his community. And it does an exceptional job of just showing this pastor in a really multidimensional light. You see him at his best and you see him at his absolute worst. And um, that film really helped me, but it never looks down at the pastor. There's plenty of films about public figures that, or, or people in the spotlight that look down at them. This film hits that sweet spot of being really honest and really empathetic, but also really tough on their subject. And that movie helped, it was a guiding light for me and how to capture and tell the story of Van Jones in particular. All right. Well, it sounds great. Brandon, Lance, thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, you guys did uh, great on this. And it's a breath of fresh air to see a political documentary that uh, feels uh, fair and balanced. And so congratulations to you guys on that. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate the chance to talk about the film and appreciate all that you do with the show.